Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for, for tuning in and joining into this particular Navigate. Navigate's all about helping you get from point A to point B and navigate through the twists and turns that exist. And I'm very excited to have none other than Paul McGee, uh, the sumo guy, as it were, Paul, here with us today. So welcome, Paul. Hi, it's great to be with you, Michael. And, and Paul, you know, it's interesting. We were just chatting before we, we officially started. Uh, 2006, you came in and did a session at ARIC in, in, when ARIC was in Sydney. And I just remember the impact that it had for me personally and had for people around. It was like, wow, that is such a, uh, a strong message. It's a simple message, yet it's powerful. I think that's actually one of the keys. And wow, if it was relevant in 2006, it's even more relevant with what the, the planet's experiencing right now. Sure. I mean, I, I, it's interesting. I've been speaking now or involved in training, speaking and coaching since 1991. And when people say to me, what is your main, did you have any career highlights? And I'd have to sort of thank Leanne Howard who brought me over at the time. And it would be speaking, I think it was at the Sydney uh, Convention Centre and it was Dr. Stephen Covey was also, uh, the late Dr. Stephen Covey was also speaking at that conference and speaking at that time and the opportunities that arose from it have been, uh, yeah, it's just been a huge highlight for me. And as you rightly say, the material that I was talking about in 2006, it's evolved and it's developed and I've refined it and I honed it. But yeah, I mean, it's never, I think, I think self-help, if you like, and looking at maybe issues around resilience and well-being and stress, and they, they were kind of like the sales industry might want to know about some of those things. But now the openness that people have got, you know, there's a phrase I came across recently, well-being leads to well-doing. And, um, you know, it is about, so well-being is about, you know, a bit of yoga and listening to some whale music. It, it's about how do I get the best out of me in order that I can give my best to others. So it's become a, yeah, really, really important topic. And as you say, probably more relevant now than it's ever been. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So guys, as we go through this, if there's a question you've got for, for Paul or myself, uh, feel free to pop that into, into the chat. We'll see that as it, as it comes through. And I guess, Paul, the, you know, the, the, the question from, from back in, in 1991 through to being known now globally as the sumo guy, how did that happen? Yeah, I think it's fair to say, Michael, that when I was at school, um, I wasn't thinking one day I'll become a motivational speaker and author and be known as a sumo guy. The background actually is in behavioural uh, um, social psychology, so people fascinate me. Um, I worked for uh, Unilever, a big multinational in HR. But unfortunately, I, within a year of working with them, and I, I would say I worked for, part of my development was they got me to um, man, work in a factory. I worked for this organization. I think you might have them in, uh, in Australia called Bird's Eye, so frozen food manufacturer. And I'd been working in HR, and then the, the factory manager said, you'll be really good for your development. Spend some time in the factory managing the 30 women on the economy beef burger line or the cheap beef burger line. And I'm like, yeah, bring it on. Um, that's two main lessons I got from that experience. Number one, don't eat cheap beef burgers. And, and secondly, in a big insight, when arrogance meets ignorance, when arrogance meets ignorance, that's a really dangerous cocktail, believe me. And I think I was a little bit of both. But unfortunately, within 12 months of starting that role, having got my degree and really sort of like thinking this is the start of my career, I became ill with the illness, which I think in Australia, maybe in New Zealand, you call chronic fatigue syndrome. Right. So it's like the equivalent of going to bed at night and your phone is on, well, it's, on, it's just flat out, there's no charge. You charge it up all night, you wake up in the morning and you look at your phone and it's only on 5% charge. And from a kind of, as a metaphor, that's how my illness impacted me, almost like zero energy. So for three years, I was up and down, improve, relapse, improve, relapse. Got to the point where I guess my charge, if you like, was on 20, 25%. And I thought, look, I can't just keep claiming invalidity benefit off the government for the rest of my life. I need to try and do something for me. So I tried to get myself maybe a little part-time job. No one would hire me because I couldn't pass a medical. 
Um, so in 1991, I hired myself. I was amazing at the interview, standout candidate. And um, yeah, I, since then, written a few books, as many people will know, and I know a number of you have read the book, some of my books, um, and spoken yet in quite a few countries. So it was actually in 2002. And again, um, it's, it's worth realizing how sometimes you can have a goal, you can have a vision, you can have your business plan and a strategy. But I'd always encourage people to have an open and curious mind and be open to th op doors might open that you weren't even aware were, were, were there to push. And in 2002, I'm doing an event in Scotland on coaching and counseling skills. And at some point on the two day course, someone says, and apologies if you've got a Scottish background, um, well, if all else fails, you can always tell them to sumo. And, and everyone looks at this guy, sumo, shut up, move on. And, and it was just a little catchphrase. We, people laughed, I laughed, didn't think anything more of it. Then I started to use the phrase a little bit more in further other sessions. And then as things evolved, I began to think, you know, brand is important. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a speaker, I'm a trainer, but I don't have a brand. I don't have an amazing backstory. I've not got an Olympic gold medal. I haven't climbed Everest, I haven't overcome cancer. But I had a number of strategies and ideas and principles. And as things evolved, we started to, um, you know, the umbrella term for these ideas became sumo, shut up, move on. But again, big, important business lesson. As I realized that I was learning a lot of life skills that were helping me as, as a guy like in my, in my 30s and 40s, what I was also aware of is what a flipping screwed up childhood I'd had. And, you know, I'd run away from home at the age of 10. Very, very dysfunctional upbringing. I remember thinking, wouldn't it be great if kids could learn some of these ideas? That you don't wait until you go through all of life's struggles, but it almost becomes part of the curriculum. So we set up Sumo for schools. And as I was saying on the on the on the pre-call, that I um we now I've got a book that comes out in October that is actually specifically based on my sumo principles, which is aimed at children aged 10 to 14. But again, the power of knowing how to adapt. You see shut up move on love lots of people love it particularly in australia but some brits are a little bit like well, that sounds rather aggressive and and although i try and explain the shut up bit is take time out stop think reflect press pause i realize that particularly in the world of education some people would say we love your ideas but we're just a bit uncomfortable about the phrase it's just a bit too near the line for us and so we now refer to sumo as an alternative definition in some contexts, which is stop, understand, move on. And we're still doing loads of work in education. And then the final thing about sumo, which I never knew when I wrote the book when it came out in 05, is that sumo, not just as an acronym, but as a word in Latin can mean to choose. And I'm thinking, wow. Life is all about the choices we make. And, and I, what I've tried to do is share these a toolbox of ideas and insights and, and give people an opportunity to consider the choices they're making and when necessary and when appropriate to make some better, wiser choices as well. Yeah, Paul, that's fantastic. And look, we're going to get into those principles a little bit later and, and start to yeah. do some of those. I think one of the things that is certainly on the Aussie's mind, and we sort of touched on this before we officially started, is there's what we hear from the UK and what's happening in the UK. So it'd be great to get sort of a little bit of a global, a global view on the UK, then talk about the real estate market, what's, you know, and how they adapted mm -hmm. and anything else that businesses are doing to, to respond to. And ultimately real estate, a lot of the time real estate thinks we're, we're real estate agents first. No, you're a business first and you're real estate second. So it'd be totally. nice to get your, your perspective on, on those as well. Yeah, I think what's really interesting to think about, just generally anyway, um, and, and we are, I would say, look, always be careful on making what I would call a mountain of assumptions based on a molehill of evidence. In other words, you hear one person's word, oh, it's terrible in the UK, or it's this, or it's that, or even it's amazing. And it's like, you know, I think a really important skill in life is critical thinking. And I think the, you know, the media likes to just give us headlines. 
you know, a, a, a form, one of the most popular um, papers in the UK is called the Daily Mail. Former editor, and this has just always been mindful of this kind of thing, because they wouldn't be unique in their perspective. A former editor of the Daily Mail said, I have two goals from every edition of this newspaper, make people angry and make them fearful. Well, talk about COVID-19 presenting that on a plate for you. So I think what we need to appreciate is the UK, um, well, I mean, the 67 million people. Um, and also, although we're not like Australian set up in states, you know, Wales kind of like can self-manage, so to speak. So too can Scotland. And then you've got England and Northern Ireland. Now, I would say that in terms of how are things in the UK, generally speaking, but I'm speaking, speaking specifically about England, we are gradually seeing more and more uh, easing of the lockdown measures have taken place. In fact, it was in the middle of May, which some, some time ago now, where actually in the UK, they allowed people to allow home visits if you're wanting to view a property, as long as there was social distancing. So that's from the middle of May. There's also been a number of government initiatives. So for instance, uh, normally in the UK, when you buy a house, we have this term called you pay some stamp duty, which is you pay an extra tax, which goes to the government based on the actual price of your house. Well, in Australian dollar terms, um, that we, we've now basically said, if you're buying a property up to a million dollars, then you don't have to pay that extra tax. So there's a lot of different incentives. But what I would say, Michael, is, you know, how are people responding? How are people doing? I think some people are still incredibly fearful. I think they're in the grip of anxiety. I think some people have been quite complacent. If you're a Liverpool soccer fan, then you're not even aware there is COVID-19 because after 30 years, you finally won the flipping Premier League. Um, and so I think there's a whole variety of things. But what I would say is this. What I notice is the, the absolute how crucial mindset is to all that's happening. I put out a tweet earlier. Um, you know, if you if life, you know, I know the old language, if life gives you lemons, that make lemonade. But hey, look, if life gives you lemons, you know, get out the recipe book. You know, if life gives you lemons, look for the ice and the gin. You know, and, and I think what we can find is this. Some people's mindset, and it happens in real estate, is we are a victim of these circumstances. And I think there are some people who are saying we need to be creators of new circumstances. And in, in fact, what you find with, with some, because I've done, I, mean, I do more work actually in the real estate industry in Australia than I do in the UK, but I do some work in the UK. And um, there's an independent owner who probably, uh, his offices are only about 20 miles from me. And he's, he's been in business 19 years. And in the midst of COVID-19, which has impacted the UK far more than it has Australia and certainly New Zealand, he's just had his record month in business. But that guy, you see, here's what's interesting. You reap what you sow. And that guy has been cultivating his business for 19 years. He is not about selling property. He's about, you know, providing a service for people. He's about connection. He's about, you know, interestingly enough, when, when there were the extreme lockdown measures, so it started sort of in the UK around about March the 20th, 22nd, and they weren't open maybe for nearly another two months before we could do anything. But, you know, this guy, Peter, he had his staff, one, he was supporting his staff big time. Secondly, ringing people up regularly, you know, about, okay, this is the current situation, just checking in on how you are, when things change, this is what we want to do. And we can talk a lot about technology and AI, and it's amazing. But do you know what I've really come to know more than anything more so now than ever before? Humans need humans. And the power of connection, something that Rick Rushton talks about, is absolutely critical and crucial. And how you, Maya Angelou, the American writer and activist, she, she said something years ago. Um, and I want to just work on it a little bit as a phrase and just get to all of us to think about this in terms of our business. She said, people won't remember what you did. They won't remember what you said, but they will remember how you made them feel. 
And I agree with that to an extent, but I think what's happened with this whole pandemic is people's emotions and maybe their awareness has been amplified. You know, it's easy to be on autopilot, you know, drifting along, doing life on fast forward. Well, this has been a global shut up moment for us. And I actually think right now in our businesses, what you do, what you say, actually, I think when people look back on this, they'll go, I do remember what you said. I do remember what you did. And I do remember how you made me feel. And I come across businesses, I'm taking my wife and daughter out tonight to, um, to a restaurant. He's not wearing the victim t-shirt. They've only been open in the UK since July the 4th. So what does he do? He sets up three additional businesses whilst we're going through lockdown. Suddenly they're doing delivering afternoon teas. They're, they're doing other things about uh, things about delivering stuff for kids and parties. He didn't, he's no, 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 he's not actually lost any staff. He is recruiting staff because he got innovative. He started to create, he looked at opportunities. It's quite a, a normally it's, it's kind of like a fine dining menu, but now he's thinking, okay, well, we still got the fine dining, but maybe yeah. I want to attract families as well. So maybe I'll put some burgers and hot dogs for the kids. And, and he's now, you can't get a reservation at a weekend until the middle of August. Yeah. So what are we? Are we victims or are we creators? The story is mixed across yeah. industries and sectors, but it's so much to do with the conversations we're having inside our heads. And, and what's interesting with this, Paul, so often I talk about there are two markets in real estate. There's the external market and this market. And I then ask uh, uh, agents, leaders in the, in the profession say, well, okay, which do you think is having the biggest impact on your success? And, you know, they go, well, actually, I think it's this market here. Occasionally they say it's the external market. So think again, it's the internal. And one of the things that we've been coaching a lot on here in Australia is um, uh, a great mindset with a great strategy will achieve the best outcome possible. And I think yeah. what, what, you're, what you're reinforcing beautifully here is, uh, I've had a lot of our clients go through and write a list of this is what you can't do. But this is all the things that you can do. And I think back to that framework you just said, there are a lot of people who are hanging on to what they can't do. And that's their reason or excuse for not doing versus if you flip yep. it over and say, hang on, let's have a look what you can do. Let's embrace what you can do and apply uh, massively. And you know, as you said, this, this, um, this restaurateur is applying that level of creativity. And I think I'm, I'm yeah, absolutely. And the only other thing that I'd say that I've had conversations with some, some uh, real estate professionals who said, when things go back to normal, I said, hang on, hang on, hang on. This might be the new norm. So, yeah. so let's look at this and say, well, okay, what are you going to take on board? Don't think I applied Zoom, I applied this for a period of time, and now I'm going to go back to what I'm doing it. Do you need everyone to turn up at the sales meeting physically or you now Zoom a sales meeting? Do you, can you actually have every single meeting with a vendor face-to-face -face, or is this now the new face-to-face? -face? So Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, starting to think about those things make a difference. So, so and I think the thing to just to sort of be aware of generally is I'm not, you know, when we say mindset is important, I'm not saying to let's just all pretend to be positive and, and all, you know, gather around the campfire singing Kumbaya. We still need to have that strategy. We still need to be creative and innovative and look for solutions. You know, Anais Nin, a French novelist said, you know, you see the world not as it is, but as we are. And so, you, so they, like you say, your market, the mindset is massively important, but I don't want to pretend, therefore everything's amazing and it's great. And if you've got a great attitude, everything will be fine, but boy, you know, it, it, it's the catalyst, isn't it? It's the springboard in which to deal with some of these challenges because there are setbacks. I mean, you know, you talk about how a business has been affected. Well, on one level, so I get the virus in March. It hits me hard for a good couple of weeks. I'm seeing all my events for the rest of the year cancelled or postponed. So it's like, well, you're the sumo guy. Your whole business is based on you travel to places and speak to large groups. So, but again, what, what's my mindset? Send that invites to the pity party 
or decide, okay, maybe I'm going to need to adapt and innovate here. You know, and I don't take any personal credit for that. It's just, it was still tough. It was still a challenge. It was still at my comfort zone. Hey, guess what? I didn't own a laptop. I, I travel loads. So I've got an office that manage everything. If I need to be, you know, contacted, send me a quick email on my phone. I didn't even have a laptop. You know, I'm a bit of a virgin when it comes to the whole technology thing. Well, Paul, adapt or die. End of. You know, I mean, although it's attributed to me, I don't think he actually said it, but you know, the future doesn't belong to the strongest or the most intelligent. The future belongs to those who are best able to adapt to change. And I think for things to improve, we sometimes need things to be disrupted. And, and that can happen consciously uh, and deliberately and intentionally, but very often it's, it's life is throwing things at you as it's done in this. But this good can come from this huge disruption. It really can. And, and Paul, I think some people might have just missed there. You, you said that you actually got the you got COVID nineteen in yeah in, in March. Could you just talk a little bit about that? So, and you know, we don't want this to be the feature because we do want to get onto some of these principles. But I think the value yeah. the value in in the kind of approach that you're suggesting is so so huge for us to make sure we're resonating and by the way probably the people who are on here are the ones that already are, are embracing of this um absolutely yeah get this message out to as, as many people as as humanly possible uh, can you talk yeah. a little bit about that how that was for you yeah so i <clears throat> my son and daughter were living with us at the time and my son's a doctor and i was becoming i suppose just feeling a little bit down and lacking it down in terms of energy wise and but it came quite quickly this sort of like feeling in a 24-hour period and at that time it was around about march you know maybe mid middle of march there wasn't that many cases in my area of people with the virus so it never even occurred to me but, you know basically my son takes my temperature and and it's like it's off the charts and that night I went to bed at seven at night. I was absolutely shattered and exhausted. I couldn't even have the, I couldn't even concentrate to watch even a, you know, a comedy program on TV. I went to bed at seven that night. That was one of the latest night times I went to bed for the next two weeks. But how it affected me, and it affects people differently. We need to be aware of it. And again, let's stress you know, 99.9% .9 of people who end up with the virus will still be living after the virus. But what we tend to hear is, is the tragic stories that have occurred. They stick. It's like negative news sticks to the brain like Velcro. And, and I, you know, as a middle-aged bloke, age 55, yeah, it did hit me harder than it hit my, my son who also became ill and his wife and my wife. And, but within about 48 hours, they were okay. With me, it was two weeks. Extreme fatigue, very high fever. Um, probably at times during the night, my wife made a very strategic decision, which was a good one, go in another bedroom, uh, leaving me on my own. But, you know, one of the things that was quite bizarre, I've never experienced this before, was the night sweats. I'd wake up in the morning and like my bed sheets were wet. It's like I'd had a bath in the middle of the night and not got dried. But it, the good news was, and I don't know why this was the case, because my son would say, well, it kind of hit you hard on one level, but the virus never spread to my lungs. It never affected my breathing. And um, two weeks, within two weeks, I'm like, I'm feeling a lot better. And within a week or two after that, I was actually doing virtual sessions. And there's a premier, I mean, I work predominantly with Manchester City as a Premier League club over here with some of their players and staff. It was actually another much smaller team called Brighton and Hove Albion. They were quite big fans of Mastumo work, one or two of their people there. And they went, we want to do an event for our players and our staff. It's not compulsory, but we want to run an event. And we want to interview you about help us deal with lockdown, help us deal with working from home, help us deal with all that we're going through. And I'm thinking, wow, you know, two weeks earlier, I was just getting over the virus. And then two weeks later, I was then doing something with, you know, some, you know, some of the most highly paid sports people in the UK. So let's be clear, we are always going to hear the really terrible stories and they will stick. And I think it's important to kind of get perspective as well. Of course, it's very serious, but, you know, the majority of people are going to be like me. They'll get it. 
and they'll come through it and they'll be okay. And, and that mountain molehill that you said, said earlier, I think is so, so valid. Can you say that again? It was the way you said it was fantastic. Yeah, sure. We often make um, a mountain of assumptions based on a molehill of evidence. So, good. so we hear a little bit of information now, and the brain does the way we're wired, the way we've evolved, we prioritize bad news, negative news. Because, you know, we talk about, you know, you have these t-shirts that go, no fear. Hey, we owe our very survival as a species to fear. So we are wired to notice threats. But sometimes we're also, we're wired in a sense that we actually notice or we create threats in our own mind. And so you hear what I'd call these tidbits of information. And we just, we've, we've built a whole case on how it all is. And it's like, no, let's, let's develop our critical thinking. Let's, let's dig deeper into the article that's online in the paper. Let's ask this person a few more questions. Because you know what I found, Michael? People are great at expressing an opinion as if it's a fact. They're great at talking about, you know, speculating as if it's a certainty. And what we've had in the UK was we've had, because we politicised the whole flipping thing, which, if I'm honest, really cheeses me off. Let's not try and deal with a flipping pandemic. Let's score points against Boris Johnson and somebody else. Yeah. And so in the UK, when we kind of like ease lockdown, people are going, and I understand why they were saying this. Well, we're going to get a second wave in July. Well, we're on the 22nd of July. Nothing's happened so far. So now oh, we're changing the script because this is, you know, we're in our summer. So now we're saying there's going to be a huge wave in winter. And then people are using this language. Um, you know, so in a worst case scenario, we could get 120,000 deaths. And some people are like, they don't hear worst case scenario. They hear 120,000 deaths. Folks, let's shut up for a moment. Let's stop and understand how the media operates, how our primitive emotional hunter-gatherer brain operates. And let's not ignore threats. Let's not be complacent. Let's not dig our head in the sand. But please, for goodness sake, for our own well-being and our own em emotional sort of stability, press pause. Take a step back and go, okay, let's just, can we just engage the logical part of our brain here for a moment? And let's look at this. And, and let's not ignore it's an issue. Of course yeah. it's an issue. Yeah. People have died, but let's also not make a mountain of assumptions based on a molehill of evidence. Yeah, yeah, it's fantastic. And Paul, one of the things that, that I talk a lot, uh, about a lot, in fact, Business of Real Estate last year, I spoke about this, and that is the concept of confirmation bias. And totally. it, it's, a, it's a massive issue on social media because if you like something, if you play a video all the way through, if you do something like that, then basically Facebook is gonna just deliver more of that particular content. So it's going to support that confirmation bias. But similarly, you know, we, we look at news, we look at evidence, we look at those things. What's going to support my current view? And if my current Family. view is not valid, I'm just going to layer on top and, and on top and on top uh, a, 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 a level of, uh, I'd simply call it stinking thinking, that's getting in the way of, 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 uh, of activating that logical brain, which is the step back and let's have a look at the, the perspective. It, uh -huh. it's, and again, Michael, that is something which, you know, we, we, we go, you know, the work that you and I do, it used to be known as, you know, we're being motivational, it's about being positive, but it's about embracing exactly what you're saying, thinking about neuroscience, thinking about how our brain is, thinking about the fact that we think we're always logical and rational about stuff, but often we're irrational. And, and we have become, particularly since the onset of social media, and it's interesting to think, isn't it? that the iPhone didn't come out until 2007. We've only had this thing for 13 years, you know. And yet, as you rightly say, we've got now, we, we, we become in our own bubble. We talk about bubbles in the UK at the moment in terms of what your own bubble is that you're going to be in. But we, if we're not careful, we operate in our own bubble. And your brain helps you find what you're looking for. Um, so I would say sometimes I need to steer it to know what to look for, but I purposely, and we're all going to be, we all do the, the confirmation bias, but I deliberately follow people on Twitter who I know I disagree with. 
uh, you know, and I and I and I do the same on 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 Facebook. I sometimes engage with people, and I like to read people's comments because I have an initial reaction. I don't agree with that, and then I'll read the read the comments and go, okay, now that's an interesting perspective that I hadn't thought about before. So I'm a big believer also in managing your mindset. I think we need to be careful about this phrase, you know, beware of consuming too much CNN, constant negative news. And we do need to be aware of what are we focusing our minds on? I'm getting people in the UK saying to me, I can't sleep, I'm over, I'm so anxious. And then I say to them this little phrase, what you take, it sounds a bit weird, but it's not, trust me. What you take to bed with you travels the night with you. Oh, that's good. And I'm not talking about your teddy bear. <laughs> and they go, well, what do you mean? And I said, you talk about not being able to sleep and being and with anxious. What's the last thing you watch, read, or listen to before you drift off to sleep? And, and, the, and so many people say, well, I always like to watch the, the main news over here at 10 o'clock at night. Well, I always watch the news last thing before I go to sleep. And the news is... The, the news doesn't go 55 year old man from Warrington has the virus and makes a full recovery. That ain't news, is it? So we hear the dramatic, we, we are, you know, the fear and the anger is activated in us. And then we wonder why we're anxious. You know, it's really interesting with this, Paul, we've got a client at the moment who has put a challenge out to his team. And for the last hour before they go to bed is to, is to turn off the phone. So, so don't go to the phone, don't engage in anything from, from, from that point of view, which is interesting because when you, when you turn that off, you have a much better chance of, of being in that particular headspace and, and focus on the right things uh, as you head to, head to bed. Love that quote. You have got some fantastic one-liners, by the way. You, you, I, know, <laughs> I know you know that. I know that you know that, but it's absolutely legendary. And I'm, I'm going to go back and listen to this and start to, to grab them all well, down. It's trying to encapsulate, you know, sometimes complex ideas, but I've never been known for the guy that's trying to, you know, overwhelm you with complexity. I try and work hard at making it simple and, and simple stuff that sticks. And just one other thing, when we're talking about, you know, drifting off to sleep, if you want the most effective way to help anybody underperform, in life, in whatever area of life it is, it's sleep deprivation. And you think, you know, and very often, I'll go that phrase again, I know it's a quote, you know, well-being leads to well-doing. But, you know, I talk about, again, you know, if you're going to be at your best, you need to rest. Your brain is, there's so much activity going on in your brain when you sleep, just as much as when you're awake. And I think one of the things that I've learned more and more about that is I want to be at my best. Remember, I'm the guy not just that had the virus, but for over three years, you know, was with, ill with this chronic fatigue syndrome. Number one thing it does is it almost like eliminates your energy. And yet a lot of people kind of go, well, I love your energy. Yeah, well, it doesn't just happen. I kind of work at it and I kind of like think, how do I manage me again so I can give of my best? So... I think there's some stuff that we overlook in a crisis. And again, I realize you know, we, let's think about the business and the market course, but let's think about ourselves and how I can put myself in the best possible state that when there are challenges, I deal with them more effectively. And when there are opportunities, I spot them. Do you know, I work with Manchester City. They, they have some of the, well, I mean, Pep Guardiola would be one of the highest sport paid sports coaches on the planet. And some of their players would be as well. Do you know what? In their training ground, one of the floors has just, just, just has bedrooms. And for certain games, if it's a home game that's kicking off maybe early, Guardiola will say to the players, get in. I want you staying at the, at the training ground the night before. You're not going home. We're not booking you into any other kind of hotel We've got the facilities on site. And here's what's fascinating. I was at the training ground a few weeks ago and the, the facilities, facilities manager says, have you ever seen the players bedrooms? And I'm like, well, I know, I know what, I know I'm aware that they have them, but I've never seen them. He says, would you like to have a look at one of them? I went, yeah, absolutely. And I'm walking down the corridor thinking, you know, you walk in, there'll be the chandelier, there'll be the gold plated taps. So, you want to get the best at some of the most highly paid sports professionals on the planet. You walk into the bedroom. There's nothing magical about it. The first thing he says to me is this. 
and they've all got blackout blinds. Rest and recovery, sleep, so crucial, so easy to overlook. You, you want to become a bit more irrational. You want to become more erratic in how you think. You want to react and jump to conclusions. Then, you know, don't, don't get much sleep. But if you want to deal well with all the challenges we've got, well-being leads to well-doing. And part of that is your sleep and your rest. Hugely important. Well, I'm, I'm absolutely loving this particular point. And uh, I, I'm a massive believer in the, in the, in the blackout bedroom to, to create that. Uh, this is the longest time I haven't been on an aircraft in maybe 30 years, by the way. So, so uh, I, I'm pining a little bit. For those who were on um, a webinar recently, I did have an aircraft just sort of sitting here as a little model to, uh, to, to do some pining. <laughs> the interesting thing is, and I'm sure this happens to you too, every time I get into an aircraft, I'm reminded during the safety demonstration to make sure you fit your own oxygen mask before you help others. And to me, yeah. it's, this, it's this life metaphor that the, the best thing you can do for other people is make sure you're looking after yourself, firstly, to be able to serve, serve others. And this point is so, so valid, as simple as it is. And I know our Victorian friends, I think it's as of last night, it's official now face marks are compulsory in public places. So there are... Um, uh, a lot of face mask sales have been occurring in the Victorian market. Um, uh, yeah, I can imagine. And it, it, it's an analogy that's been used. I mean, I use this about the oxygen mask. And it's, the point is now, if people are hearing that, they can become almost like, oh, yeah, 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 put your own oxygen mask on. It's like, guys, you know, let, let's just wake up and smell the coffee here. This is not optional. This is mandatory. You know, and I do... You know, let's be honest. I mean, I'm, I'm not a runner. I don't go to the gym anymore. I do, I do stretching. I walk probably maybe perhaps seven to eight miles a day. And, but I'm, I'm generally checking in on my diet. And, you know, I became ill with the virus, but I'm, I was at a good body weight. Um, and I was a health, pretty healthy diet. And I'm thinking... You know, and I didn't have any underlying health issues. And I know some people do through no fault of their own. I appreciate that. But I was just thinking, well, if I'd have been making some bad lifestyle choices in the last 10 years, which is, you'll know, Michael, is really easy to do when you're out on the road so much. Absolutely. And I was thinking, wow, how would, how would my immune system cope? So actually, I'm not taking any credit for why I got well at all. I'm just thankful for my immune system and how it fought the virus. But I think, I, gave my, I think I gave my immune system a bit of a helping hand. Now, that might sound a little bit arrogant. I appreciate that. And maybe I only gave it a helping hand by one or two percent. But the fact is, maybe I did give it a bit of a help because of the lifestyle choices I made. And I, I enjoy a beer. I, I'm probably drinking a little bit more beer now than I normally do. It's become a little bit of my, you know, I'm enjoying it. Um, but I'm, I'm taking those regular walks. I'm, I'm managing the whole thing about my mental diet. I'm listening to podcasts. Um, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm thinking, what am I feeding my mind and how am I looking after myself physically as well? And I think it has made a difference. In fact, I don't think I know it has. Yeah. And, and Paul, I, I know I'm sure you're a big fan of Jim Rowan. And, you know, that wonderful quote of Jim Rowan's, you know, success is a few simple disciplines practiced every day. And failure is a few errors in judgment repeated every day. And, you know, I, I absolutely endorse the fact that, that, okay, I add a kilo per, per year for the next 10 years. Where does that take me to? Or I maintain uh, the weight that my ideal weight for the next 10 years. Where does that take me to? And look, I know, yeah. I, I know guys, we're talking about things that, that, that may be a, a, a not business focused, but they're totally business focused. Um, calling five clients every single day and doing a check-in call. And we've talked, Paul, in our marketplace about doing value calls and care calls. So, you know, the ones you described earlier, those care calls, are you okay if you need anything? And then the value calls is, okay, well, how do we help you with your property journey? Because there's still property journeys needed out there. So it's that balance totally. between, the, between the two, uh, which is great. Um, any other sort of key principles that you would say that, that really underpin the, the sumo message. And I'm sure everyone's picked up um, uh, shut up, move on, or stop, understand. I prefer shut up, move on, personally. Um, I think, I, I think <laughs> so I do I. New Zealanders are going to be totally okay with that. 
I love how you've, you've um, um, uh, educationized it in terms of style yeah. understand and understand. Uh, and is it still move on? Yeah, it's still, we're all, whether you're stopping or understanding or shutting up, you've got to move on either way. Yeah. And then yeah. the whole thing about choose, which again links in with Rome's thing, isn't it, Jim Rome's? And again, that links in with that is about self-awareness because part of the whole shut up approach was get off autopilot because that what you've said of Jim Rohn's quote is those just become aware that those, you know, the, the compound effects of our behaviours. Like the book I recommend more than any other at the moment, and I will talk a little bit about some of my summer principles in a moment, but would be Atomic Habits by James Clear. And if you know, if you haven't got that book, you need to get it. I'm not on commission. I wish I was. But it's a lot about um, those small incremental changes that we make that over time, it's the compound effect. As you summarized, Michael, with if you put on a kilo a, a year, then where are you going to be in 10 years? And it's just be more mindful and aware. And I think sometimes, you know, when we're at a conference, when you're at ARIG, even when you listen to a podcast, I think the, the brain gets titivated by the new, the novel. They li we like that. You know, what's the one major thing that you've never thought about it? And then you've got some bloke from Manchester going, you've got to think about your sleep. You've got to take rest. You've got to still look after yourself. You've got to do your one percenters. You've got to do this. You've got to have the discipline. You know, I would always say that discipline, motivation might get you started, but, but discipline will get you there. And, and you're kind of going, well, I've heard this before. Of course you've flipping heard it before. You know, the best tennis player possibly in the history of the sport is, is Roger Federer. Do you know what? He's still got a coach. He still practices his serve. You know, Stephen Covey, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, sharpen the saw. Why do I listen to Leanne Pilkington's podcast on Courageous Conversations and, and listen to Rick and Peter Kacos, uh, Rick Rush and Peter Kacos on Voices of Value? And other podcasts that I, you know, feed and nourish myself because I want to get, keep the edge. And I think we just need to, you know, don't, there's a, there's a verse actually in, in, um, in, a, in, a, in a Hebrew writing, Jewish writing, and it goes, don't despise the day of small things. Don't despise that. Yeah, it's the little stuff. It adds up, guys. Just don't despise it. Don't, don't, don't listen to a podcast and go, well, that was a little idea. Well, yeah, that's obvious. Yeah, of course things are obvious. They're always obvious, though, in hindsight. It's not, do you know it? Are you doing it? And are you doing it daily? Now, in terms of my own sumo ideas, I have a little formula, E plus R equals O. Events plus response influences the outcome. And I think what you get with a lot of people is they live life with E equals O. Well, if that's the event, if there's a lockdown, you know what the outcome is. We'll try telling that to the guy whose restaurant we're going to tonight because he had the same event as other restaurant owners. He's now grown his business. His outcome is more business than ever. Why? Not because of the event, because of how he responded to it. Another idea which I have, which is a bit left field for someone who's described as a motivational speaker, but you know, hippo time is okay. What are hippos doing? Mud, they wallow. And, and sometimes we need to give ourselves permission in all that's happened. You know, it is okay to not always feel okay, to feel mad, bad, and sad. They are legitimate human emotions. And I don't think being at my best is, is saying that I'm amazing every single day. I just sometimes go, you know what? I'm having a bit of a hippo time today. And that's okay, but it's temporary. Part of your journey it's not meant to be your destination. So you can have a little bit of a hippo moment or a, a hippo day, if you like. But you kind of go, okay, this is part of how it is. We're not, you know, a machine that we can just flick it on straight away. Sometimes we just need to acknowledge we're in hippo time or someone else is. And so one of the Paul, other principles so is Paul, called, Paul, can oh, I do you want to come in? in? Yeah, sorry, Michael. I'm going to jump in. So what I love about hippo time is you've given it a label. So a lot of people go, I'm not feeling good. I, actually, I'm having some hippo time. So you've, you've done a great job of externalizing that in the first instance, you know, from a, totally. a, a psychology point of view. But what I'm also loving is, is the fact with this that I've seen so many people, I'm not feeling good. I should be feeling good. I know better than that. So they add a layer, I, they feel bad about feeling bad. So it gets worse, Absolutely. it doesn't get better. But if you just go, I'm having some hippo, some hippo time, Okay, good. I love the, the mad, sad, uh, mad, bad and sad. 
great, I've acknowledged that, let's then move on. And this is a huge part of resilience. I, I, I did some interesting research and I thought that people who were, you know, um, had a positive mental attitude only had positive thoughts, not true. People who are negative only have negative thoughts, not true. It's just the way they own those particular thoughts in, in a way that makes a difference. And I love hippo time, that's fantastic. Yeah, and, and I think one of the things that I'm doing, and I'm doing it in the book for, for young people, because there's this real, we're not careful and it's like in Australia, but we're kind of, there's a phrase which I came across a few years ago, which, which said previously with like young people, particularly there was the phrase, prepare the child for the road. Fair enough. Now, certainly in the UK, and I think in certain parts of the States, I can't comment in Australia and New Zealand, but it's like now we've, we've changed that, we've flipped it, and we're saying prepare the road for the child. Not prepare the child for the road, prepare the road for the child. In other words, let's try and smooth over any bumps or possible setbacks or challenges. And if we're not careful, we're, making, we're creating kids who have become more fragile, who are less resistant, who have a feeling and they eventually go, well, I'm not feeling happy. I'm feeling, I'm feeling sad. So I must be depressed. And, and, you, and, and you're right about feelings. If we're not careful, we start to own them as our identity. You know, I am depressed. Well, actually, I am feeling a little bit low at the moment. Paul McGee is feeling a little bit low. Massive difference. Massive. Massive difference. Don't own the identity of the feeling. It's a bit like clouds in the sky. And tell you, flipping northwest of England has too many flipping clouds in the sky, particularly in our summer. <laughs> Not that I'm bitter. Um, get me over to Perth or somewhere. But clouds in the sky, even in the northwest of England, they're there, they're real. They fade, they move on. And feelings like that as well. And so a, a lot of my, my, my approach is equipping young people and adults with the tools they need to deal with challenges. And one of them is, it's okay to not always feel okay. Hippo time. Fantastic. We've got time for one more insight and then I'd love to actually share with the guys how they can, can follow you, contact you, uh, keep up to date with this uh, amazingly simple yet super powerful message. I think one of the things I'd leave you with, uh, and it's something which you, some of you, I know some of you are on this meeting, I've, I've, like, I've come across me before, read my books, heard me speak, but I have this metaphor, remember the beach ball. And um, here's one I blew up earlier. And if I was to show it you, and it's like, I'm showing you this beach ball and you can see the colors red, yellow, and orange. I'm looking at the same thing and I'm seeing blue, white, and green. And I think in life, if we're not careful, we just see things from our perspective, going back to your point about the confirmation bias. And I think sometimes we're gonna engage and influence people we work with, our colleagues, our, our clients, the vendors, the tenants, whatever. We just need to keep on taking time out, not to make assumptions about other people's side of the beach ball, but to shut up thinking our perspective is the only perspective there is and move on and, and see where other people are coming from. And there's an analogy or a phrase, which I don't know, it's been a little bit overdone, but I still think it's very important, which is we're all in the same storm but we are in different boats and our circumstances are very, very different for all kinds of reasons. And I mean, again, Jim Rome's analogy of, you know, when, you, when you're out sailing and the wind changes the direction, the optimist says, well, let's wait, you know, the wind will change direction again soon. The, the, the pessimist is going, it's, it's terrible, but the leader adjusts the sails. And I think, we need to appreciate when we're engaging with other people, their view of the beach ball is different to ours, maybe in certain circumstances, and to maybe have some compassion and understanding for why that's the case. But then to recognize whichever boat we are in, we can learn to steer the boat more effectively. And that means sometimes being prepared to adjust our sails. And for me personally, I've had to get feedback from other people on how they see me, how they see my business, understand their side of the beach ball not just mine and, and the beach ball which and it can help reduce conflict it can also mean when you've got a team meeting rather than someone go well i disagree or i think you're wrong can sometimes go well can i just share an observation from my perspective because from where i'm looking i'm seeing a bit of blue and a bit of white but i'm seeing red yellow and orange well maybe it's both maybe not maybe we're both right and so i think it's a 
fascinating metaphor that's got many different outworkings in terms of communication with each other, but just asking myself, you know, I still am conditioned to see myself and my business and my world in a certain way. What, what is a perspective I haven't thought about before? You know, in diversity, help me be controversial, isn't just about gender or ethnicity. It's about people who can also think differently. They might actually look very similar, but they think different. And that can actually be a really, really healthy thing. Remember the beach ball. And uh, I'm, this is a, an awesome final point to to, uh, to to wrap on because the ability to see some others, someone else's point of view, and and the the conflict resolution capability in that in that little perspective, no, you're wrong, versus this is how I'm seeing it. Uh, th that shift, uh, uh, Paul, I, I'm sure you're aware of it. Is as simple as that is. It's massive in terms of the way people communicate within an office, within a business, and also within life. Totally. Well, you see, if I tell you you're wrong, um, you don't go, oh, right, yeah, you're probably right, I am wrong. Tell me what your perspective is. You're automatically, as you rightly say, you're going to defend your position. Now, no. then to get political, what was very interesting in the 2016 election in the US, when Hillary, bless her, decided to accuse Donald Trump's fans of, of being um, a basket case of deplorables, they didn't go, actually, Hillary, you're probably right, we are. What were we thinking? You've got our vote. They flip and started to make T-shirts and, 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 and have baseball caps with, I'm one of the deplorables. Whereas when you try and engage and understand other people's perspective and understand where they're coming from and see where there is some agreement and what we can agree on, you put people to the less defensive, they might become a little bit more open to hear what you've got to say. Yeah, uh, Paul, just uh, amazing insights and a fantastic perspective. I think you're the kind of person that could, we could go on this, uh, this, this, this chat, this conversation, this interview for hours, and the depth of knowledge you have is, is amazing. What you shared with us here today, I think, has a direct impact from both a personal and also a professional perspective. And to me, that's, a, that's an ultimate gift. So, uh, hey, thank you so much for, for giving... What I'd love to know is, for, for everyone who's tuned in, what's the best way of connecting with you, following you, uh, gaining information? What's your, your best channel? Sure. Well, and I'll put in an ad for hopefully for 2021. You know, my, my favourite, probably my favourite two countries in the world would be Australia and New Zealand. Um, and um, I'm hoping I will get back certainly to Australia next year in what will be probably August time. But um, my website is thesumoguy.com and I'm pretty active on social media, particularly on Twitter and Instagram. And the handle or the name is the same for both Twitter and Instagram, and that is at the sumo guy. If you go onto my website, you can subscribe to a newsletter. I probably only send one out once every four or five weeks, but um, it's a way of maybe just keeping in touch as well. And it's also a way of knowing when I'm going to be coming, hopefully, back to Australia or even potentially New Zealand in the future, because I've loved this. But I'll be honest with you, to actually maybe be having a, a beer or a coffee with you face to face somewhere, Michael, or speaking at an event with, with people is, is still my preferred option. But I'll take this at the moment. Yeah, Paul, absolutely awesome. Uh, guys, can we do a, a, a virtual round of applause for none other than Paul McGee? Uh, I'm just <laughs> thinking, beg your pardon? No, I'm just saying thanks very much. I appreciate yeah. it. It's, uh, it's out outstanding. Uh, lots of comments coming through around uh, the difference that, that it's making. I'm getting text messages, by the way, as to the, the insights that are being shared. So, uh, Brilliant. That's it's wonderful. Brilliant. It's been great being with you. It really has, Michael. Thoroughly thanks. enjoyed it. Thanks, Paul. And, and when you're down, let's actually let's do something from uh, the, the point of view of getting in front of some of these amazing real estate professionals and entrepreneurs who are looking to make a difference. Because... What you do, clearly, not only in the, the UK you've made a difference, but globally you've made a difference. And, and that's, a, that's a, a, a huge value add to, to the planet. So thank you. I oh, really appreciate that. Thanks, Michael. All right, guys. Uh, the key now is, is literally you taking this information and applying it. So uh, one thing is the gift of uh, being given it. The second thing is, so now what are you going to do? Uh, what I love to do in something like this is quite simply do a, a start, stop, continue. So what am I going to start doing? What am I going to stop doing? What have I had confirmed 
that I know I'm on the right track with. You know, Paul's done a fantastic job of, of, of what, what he said has resonated with what I'm currently doing. I'm going to continue doing it. And I just think if you look at that from a personal and professional point of view, the impact of this hour we've invested together could be absolutely huge, but not just the, the next month or two, but literally for the rest of your life. So thanks for tuning in. Appreciate it. And thanks for being part of the Navigate series. Oh, 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 oh,